Welcome everyone who's just joining us. If you can give us another minute, we'll get started on the hour. Okay, we'd like to get this started. I wish a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our World Coffee Research members and friends calling in from around the world. I am delighted to welcome you to our annual Think and Drink event, the virtual edition. I hope you have your favorite drink in hand, and we are, we are excited to provide you with a great think over the next hour. So I'd like to begin with some introductions first. Um, if I can have my colleagues turn on their cameras right now. My name is Alexa Heinecke. I'm the Senior Corporate Membership Manager. With me today are Dr. Vern Long, our CEO, Dr. Tanya Humphrey, our Director of Research and Development, and Maeve Holler, our Communications Manager. And we're also honored to have James McLaughlin with us today, who's the President and CEO of Intelligentsia Coffee as well as the vice chair of our board of directors and member of the finance committee. So over this next hour, we look forward to sharing key highlights of our research from the past year, introduce our Robusta catalog, and take a deeper look at our breeding work. Then we aim to reserve the last 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So please type your questions as you think of them in the box to the right of your screen, and then also upvote the ones that you find most interesting. So without further ado, I would like to hand it off to uh, James. Thanks, Alexa. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to everybody. It's awesome to have all of you here with us today. Um, we have an amazing sort of uh, bit of work that we're going to share with you. And all of this is possible because of members like you. Um, we have a phenomenal group of companies and organizations around the world that support WCR's scientific research. Um, you see here we have an amazing group of 51 new member companies that joined in 2022. So everything that you're going to hear about today is because companies like you have decided that this is an important um, uh, place to invest your money. Um, I can tell you for Intelligentsia, the reason, there are two main reasons why we um, are huge advocates for world coffee research and, and the stuff that's happening. The first is, um, as many of you know, the quality of the coffee that we all get to enjoy every day comes primarily from what's happening on the farms. And this is the first time, I think, in, in probably the history of coffee, where we have a group of scientists who are working day in and day out to figure out what are the things that unlock higher quality coffee. So that's really, really exciting. And then the second thing that's just a fact of life that many of you, I think, know is that climate change is real. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience when I've gone down to visit farmers recently, um, the changes that are happening with the weather, whether it's more rain, whether it's less rain, whether it's increased temperatures, it's having a dramatic impact on the farmers who we work with. And World Coffee Research has a scientific research agenda focused on giving farmers the tools that they need to be successful as the climate continues to change. So, um, I just wanna thank you all for all of your support. I'm super excited for the, the agenda today. I think you're gonna find it all really fascinating. I will tell you that I personally think that the work that WCR is doing is probably the most exciting thing happening in coffee today. Um, and, I, and I think that after you see the presentations, um, you'll agree. So I'll turn it back to Alexa. Thank you again for coming and your support. Thank you so much, James. So um, I'm going to just jump in here with 
the beginning of the the talk really about who WCR is. So many of you are new to WCR. Some of you are prospects thinking about, you know, contributing or engaging in the work that we do and stewarding the work that we do. But we also have a number of companies who are here today who have been longstanding partners and supporters of the work that we do. And just to really clarify and to level set for all of us, um, our organization is here because you created us, you the industry created us to unite the entire industry to drive a science-based agricultural solutions. We focus on technology that affects impact at scale, a high leverage investment that a global organization can steward and lead um, with the industry's interests and the farmer's interests at the core of what we do, looking for that shared agenda. And so as we think about why it is that the, the industry came together to create WCR and, and why it's so urgent that we, you know, as James mentioned, it's so urgent that we continue to invest in this work and accelerate that progress is that climate change is real. And yet our industry is completely dependent on a very narrow base of innovation. When we think about how our industry is structured with many low income producing countries, bearing the brunt of climate change, but also generating the amazing product that we all know and love in the many, many different varieties or, or flavors of, and experiences of coffee. All of that rests on a very small number of varieties that were developed in the last century for the most part that are the source of innovation for farmers today. And as, as James described, the production environment is changing and it's changing more rapidly than ever before. And we need to really think very strategically about what it's going to take to shore up supply, both to reduce production risk for farmers, but also to ensure the long-term supply of coffee for the broad industry. And our, our fates are shared, there's no question. If farmers aren't successful, neither will our industry. And so when we think about this in very practical terms, I just want to offer this very concrete visual of what it is that we do for those of you who are, particularly those who are new to WCR. We focus on varieties because it is a foundational technology in agriculture. And what we mean by that is really effectively illustrated in this picture. The variety on the left is a coffee leaf rust susceptible variety. You can see that there aren't many leaves on the tree. And the variety on the right is a coffee leaf rust resistant tree. Now, as I'm sure many of you are very deeply familiar, coffee leaf rust is the equivalent of COVID for coffee. It has caused tremendous production losses, exposes farmers to huge risks, um, and requires management strategies that are, are quite challenging and costly and not always successful. But when you have a variety that is naturally resistant to the leaf rust, you can have tremendously productive agricultural production without having to use pesticides or other, um, other management tools that can be costly to a farmer. A farmer can invest in the variety itself and that technology keeps on resisting the, the leaf rust or being resilient to climate change. Varieties are a very, very powerful tool in the toolbox of technologies that farmers need to use to manage production and manage risk and, and um, create a livelihood. So why we focus on innovations specifically in varieties is because we seek to ensure that this technology, which benefits from global collaboration can be available to farmers around the world. We know that productivity is a real challenge for farmers. In uh, Brazil, Vietnam, and Colombia, the National Coffee Institutes have done a tremendous job of generating technology, including varieties, to support farmers' livelihoods. And you can see that the, the light green line that's going very, you know, at a 45 degree angle up the graph, this is yield. This is how much um, coffee is produced on you know, the, same, the same land or the same trees. So when you have growing productivity um, over time, this is essentially the equivalent of a pay raise for farmers. So for those of you who don't really love economics graphs, I mean, this is a basic question around how can we ensure that for all of the work that a farmer does, that they get a return on their investment and their time. And productivity is a key part of that. When we think about the challenges in the countries where WCR focuses our work, the 11 focus countries, you can see that productivity has been very flat in the last few decades. And the consequence of that is something that we've seen in terms of the challenges that farmers are facing to maintain production in the face of low productivity. And when you combine that with the challenges of climate change, we know that our ability to deliver high, highly productive uh, 
coffee for farmers and for, you know, varieties for farmers and uh, supply for the industry is really challenged. And we have to think differently about this. And that's why we as an organization exist to scour the landscape and identify the best way to mobilize investment and execute uh, you know, research programs that drive value for farmers and ultimately manage the supply risk for uh, the industry. So when you think about what we're doing and what we need to do, we can think about it this way. If climate change is our flood, then innovation is our arc. It's the way that we can manage the risk. It's not that we can stop the risk from happening. The challenges and risks are coming at us and they're coming more fast and more volatile. We can't predict them as easily, but innovation really, really helps reduce that risk and exposure over time. But so I think that as we think about the investments that we make in the years ahead, um, we really feel that anchoring our investments in the variety technology, while we support national partners to uh, invest in agronomy and the critical investments in innovation at a, at a local level, that combined, we really can drive value for the whole community. So when you look at our portfolio, our portfolio is a, a broad, um, diversified portfolio that spans both um, near-term outputs. So you'll see that our nursery program involves a lot of training and uh, quality assurance, technical assistance that really helps immediately. It improves the quality of the trees in the nursery or in the seed system at this time in the next one to three years to enable farmers to have higher quality, more predictable performing material. So our nursery program is really about these near term immediate consequences of choosing varieties that look more like the trees on the right with all the leaves and try to reduce farmers exposure to those trees on the left that are much more risky to produce. And so our nursery program is really designed for these more shorter term activities. We have a trial uh, program that tries to bring in available varieties. So recognizing that um, while we know we must innovate for the future and breeding is a foundational investment for our industry to make to ensure variety technology is available, not just in the next five and 10 years, but for the next 20 and 30 and 40 years, breeding programs are foundational to ensuring that we deliver that. But we realize they also have very long timelines. And so we feel that our portfolio has to deliver outputs that generate value in the short, medium and long term. And so in our trials program, we seek to bridge that difference between immediately available materials through the nursery program and the longer term wait that is ahead of us in the months ahead and the years ahead. So um, the last part I wanted to, to note was the investments that we have been growing in our global leadership space. And this is something that has been a very proactive and, and actively engaged with many of our member companies, where we seek to mobilize public investment, greater public investment in coffee agricultural R&D, because we realize that our industry is really, really vulnerable given the underinvestment over the decades uh, leading to today. So when we think about how WCR drives change, what is this global leadership that we're talking about. So as an organization, at, based on our current member, member contributions, we have about $5 million a year that we invest in this core foundational investment in breeding technology, developing new varieties in partnership with national programs who are also making their own national investments to participate and collaborate with our work. And so together with our national partners, this is the direct kind of work that we do. And we use the investments that you all provide to drive that agenda forward. We also um, engage our member companies, not only to finance the work that we do, but also to mobilize public investment around a shared agenda. So what we have realized is that as a small organization, we can only do so much with the investments that we have and the scale and the magnitude of the challenges facing coffee are enormous. And so we must work more catalytically with a higher leverage engagement to ensure that we can mobilize the resources necessary for the future of coffee. And so our advocacy work and our engagement with our member companies in each of their respective countries, working with national governments to mobilize investment and direct that investment in the most strategic ways is an area that um, will continue to, to grow in the years ahead. I'd say it's about 1% of my time. It's not that I spend an enormous amount of time on it, but it's very, very high leverage investment for our industry when we think about the challenges facing us um, as an industry. 
So one of the areas that we've been focused on um, in the past year has been to um, really better understand this financing gap. So when we've gone to the public donors, to development donors, GIZ um, in Germany or Global Affairs Canada in Canada in the US with USAID, the question that they ask is, you know, what is the investment gap in coffee? Why is it that we should lean into this crop? Why should we provide support when there are so many challenges facing smallholder production in many other commodities around the world? And so we actually embarked on this exercise to better understand what that challenge is and what that global investment gap is. At the same time, we've been um, engaging with public officials in the US around specific pieces of legislation that really would expand the investments made in key areas like pest and disease research. Um, and so the Coffee Plant Health Initiative Amendment Act is one that we've been working very hard on for the last couple of years. And we really hope that with your support as member companies engaging with your members of Congress, for those of you who are here in the US, that we can get this legislation passed, which would create resources, not just for WCR, in fact, we probably wouldn't touch you know, much of those resources, but that other researchers around the world can have financing to tackle the pests and diseases that we see on the horizon. This is actually really critical because um, ensuring that there's essentially water upstream, like in the dam, is critical for us to then orient those resources to the most important thing. In the last 20 years, coffee leaf rust has been really critical to tackle in the Western hemisphere, but new pests and diseases will emerge and they're going to become increasingly a challenge in other production areas. And we need to have the resources at the ready to start to tackle those questions and develop solutions. And so it's this long-term orientation of advocacy where we seek to grow the investment pie around coffee agricultural R&D and then provide that technical guidance and input from our industry and our partnerships with producing country uh, research institutes to identify the most strategic areas of research to, to, um, to move the agenda forward. And so our work um, here, for those of you who are US companies, you're welcome to scan the QR code and then you can get more information about how you can contribute to this advocacy agenda here in the US. But for a moment, I'm gonna take us back to this question around the investment gap. So we engaged economists at Michigan State University, Dr. Maiwish Meridia, and she and her team um, estimated the uh, long-term investment needs required to ensure that coffee productivity can go from that flat you know, picture that you saw earlier to something a bit more um, productive. And when we think about this investment gap, um, it's actually pretty large. Um, compared to what our current investments are. So we estimated the amount of national investment. So this is producing country investment as well as um, advanced research institutes in consuming countries who are um, providing, uh, contributing research resources to the, to the agenda. And um, in, in looking at that total investment gap, we estimate there's just over $100 million a year of investment in coffee agricultural R&D. But then when we look at consumption growth, we used a projection of around two and a half percent over the next um, 30 years, um, at two and a half percent per year of consumption growth. And then the challenges that we project with climate change, we brought in a number of the climate models to look at the effects on productivity. And this led us to this investment number. So the point of this exercise was to say, how big is the problem? And how can we start to um, work with each consuming country government to help them understand their fair share? So here in the United States, for example, one way of thinking about this is the US consumes about 16% of the world's coffee. And so if we were to think about the, um, you know, the, uh, a fair share approach, we could start looking at consumption levels or other metrics for figuring out how to fairly apportion this investment level to come alongside producing country governments who are already making significant investments um, that are, are challenging to make because there's so many trade-offs. But so this really helps us focus the number, understand what we're, what we're really seeking and what it's gonna require to finance the innovation that's necessary to address the climate challenges of the future. So in the coming year and the next two years, we'll be working with many of you who are member companies um, and producing country governments and consuming country governments to bring together an action plan for identifying the key research priorities that we need to tackle together as a community and at a regional level, um, as well as what kinds of investment can be uh, mobilized to ensure that we can uh, develop the innovation necessary in the months and years ahead. So um, one of the things that we've done is to really you know, guide conversations and guide understanding is really developing tech, uh, knowledge products that help um, shape everyone's understanding of the, the needs on the horizon. So there's the economic analyses that we've undertaken, but then there's also 
new videos that we've developed that provide very concrete, actionable information for um, act, uh, nursery operators in, um, in producing countries. We have those videos now in French, English, and Spanish that are very practical, technical guidance. Um, we also have contributed to collaborations with other institutions. Um, the Conservation International and a network of partners have been working on the Shade Catalog, which again, we're focused on coffee varieties at WCR, but we realize that we work in an ecosystem, not just as an organization, but obviously coffee is grown in a broader ecosystem. And so we contribute to the development of tools and technology and information that really helps uh, growers figure out how they can most effectively harness um, the best um, the best curated knowledge out there because sometimes it's very hard to know you know where the the uh, adjudicated knowledge is and this is what we seek to to offer in the knowledge products so you know as we think about uh, the key areas that we've worked on I'm going to turn this over to Maeve now um, but a huge project in the last couple of years has been the development of the Robusta catalog and I'll let uh, Maeve give you a, a deeper highlight into that into that work in recent months over to you Maeve Thanks, Vern. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, as Vern says, I'm going to highlight something that's very exciting. Our new varieties catalog, which was just officially released last week. Um, the catalog is just one example of the tangible work that WCR does to generate consensus on key topics and share knowledge across our industry. Um, so this resource is an expansion of our original and very popular Arabica catalog that was released in 2016. Um, that version of the catalog only included 55 Arabica varieties. Um, it now also includes profiles of 47 Robusta varieties from eight countries around the world, such as Brazil, Mexico, Uganda, Asia, Vietnam, India, Thailand, and Philippines. The catalog underwent um, a complete redesign. Let me get to our next slide here. Um, to make it more are accessible to users, especially farmers um, who might need uh, resources that are non-digital or in Spanish. Um, you can easily toggle between Spanish and English depending on your preference um, and choose to either explore uh, Arabica or Robusta. In addition, um, using the Build Your Own page, you can now create a customizable and printable PDF with varieties of your choice. This one seems really simple, but it's actually my favorite. Um, you can now search the catalog seamlessly using features um, like keywords. So you can find the information you're looking for faster rather than scrolling through the whole site. Um, and on the homepage of our catalog, um, you can check out this interactive data visualization, um, which shows the relationship between both species and their respective varieties. Um, the tool is really cool. It allows you to zoom in and see how everything's interconnected. Um, and while we're really thrilled about the expansion of the catalog and the access that it's granting to this new information, I want to touch on the fact that this resource is what we call a living document. Um, it will continue to grow and change as more regions of the world are studied and as new varieties are developed globally. So. If you see anything that you think is missing from this catalog, don't worry, we're hopefully going to update it within the coming months and years. Um, and in this spirit, creators of varieties or producers that are growing varieties that cur aren't currently included in the catalog can submit this information via the website for consideration. Um, we recognize that things are always evolving when it comes to coffee agricultural R&D, and we hope to keep in step with these developments as they occur. Um, so, that was a really quick overview. You can head to our website to see the full catalog in all of its glory, um, but I'm gonna hand things back over to Vern to continue with some updates about our nursery and breeding programs. Thanks, Maeve. And I really encourage all of you to take a visit to our website and check out the variety catalog. It's a really important tool. In fact, in my first week's in this role in 2019, I, I met some farmers who immediately referred to the variety catalog. So I have definitely um, learned that this is an, incredi an incredibly important tool for everyone across the supply chain in coffee. And so I hope that um, you, you find this to be a resource that's helpful to you as well in the, in the months and years ahead. So I'm going to take us a step back into the weeds, which of course as a botanist is my favorite place to be. Um, I really want concrete actions and activities that we've undertaken in the last year. Um, and I'm just gonna go program by program 
um, for nurseries, trials, and breeding. And then we're going to have a conversation with Tanya to really dive into the breeding program because that's an incredibly exciting investment that we've um, launched and we're really excited about um, the possibilities that it brings. But let's start with nurseries because at the end of the day, if farmers can't access material, then what's the point of getting new varieties, you know, um, up at the end of the, you know, at the top of the pipeline, we need to make sure that that material is moving through planting material distribution systems and getting into the hands of farmers so that they can have opportunity um, and choices. So over the last few years, we have been partnering under a US Department of Agriculture funded initiative called MOCA. Many of you may know it's led by TechnoServe. It's a $35 million um, multi-year investment that's happening in coffee and cacao in Central America and in Peru and Ecuador. And so the coffee activities are happening in Central America and in Peru. And we have been an active partner across all of those activities in Central America and Peru over the last few years. And our nursery training program has been actively involved in helping nurseries take their current practices and just improve those practices, going from a baseline where maybe um, you know, operators may not be sure. As any of you who run a small business may know, you have to make trade-offs in how you use resources. And any small or medium-sized enterprise realizes that those trade-offs, you'd really like to have evidence of what is the best return on investment for making changes to your operations so that you can really generate the best value for your customers, the farmers who use those trees, but as well um, create a viable livelihood and a viable business for yourself. And so this nursery training program is really anchored around the actions that operators need to take to ensure the quality and the health of the plants. And one of the tools that we've developed has dramatically reduced the cost of ensuring the genetic um, integrity, the genetic conformity of a variety. So if you have a, if you have a tree and you, you know, you're just a farmer buying a tree at a local nursery, you don't necessarily know whether it's genetically pure or not, whether it's going to give you the performance if you reflect back on the, the original picture I showed you of the leaf rust susceptible and the leaf rust resistant varieties, you want to make sure as a farmer that you're getting the one that's resistant if that's what you're trying to, you know, to purchase. And so genetic testing is a really important basic tool. It's something that many and many other crops have. And it's something that we developed a very low cost tool to support nurseries to enable them to verify the genetics of the trees that they're selling. And so this very basic, um, tool, we've, uh, we've been rolling it out and have been using it across many nurseries in the region to help them understand um, what the genetic conformity is of the trees that they're selling, and then help them take steps to manage that genetic conformity and manage the, the quality of trees. And so this work is um, has been launching in Uganda as well. So in addition to the activities to train nurseries to improve their quality assurance systems in-house um, in the region, we also have been uh, starting activities in Robusta in Uganda. So historically, you know, we've worked a lot in Arabica and we're increasingly taking more and more steps in Robusta. We learned from a recent member survey that 39% of our member companies procure Robusta. So we are hearing from you all that you want this greater investment in Robusta and we're responsive because in the end, we are we're here because the industry wants us to really be a leader and identify those areas that can really help farmers and help ultimately reduce risk in the supply chain. So, um, the, the activities are really around developing low cost genetic tools. So in Uganda, we're working on that for the Robusta tree, really to just reduce that cost and quality assurance and make it feasible. And then um, in El Salvador, one of the key areas is that the government has a very ambitious um, and exciting renovation plan. And in order to execute that program, they really wanted to understand what is the um, what are the available sources of planting material for such a huge and ambitious, I think it's a $300 million plan to renovate. And so um, the, this is the kind of support that we've offered um, to really help uh, national governments make strategic choices in the use of their resources and ensure that they get um, a lot of value out of their um, you know, renovation and, and planting material distribution programs. So going forward in 2023, we are going to build on that work that we have through MOCA. So MOCA continues through 2024, the activities in Central and South America. And we're gonna be deepening our efforts um, in Peru in particular around seed lot cleaning up, um, really ensuring that the source of the seeds for many of the growers and the co-ops are genetically conforming. And so we'll be working closely with uh, co-ops in Peru to, to really amplify and accelerate that work as well as in Uganda. And so um, these activities in the region are across Central and South America are really important to our work because we wanna make sure that farmers, when they go to a nursery, 
are able to access high quality printed material. And this is, these are the first steps that we have to take to um, support that pipeline. In our trials program, um, I first wanted to thank many, many, many of you across our member community um, who have been contributing to the performance evaluation of the materials. So while we lean on our partners in producing countries to grow the materials, many across the member companies have been evaluating the quality of these copies. So we have been sending these um, materials to you all to tell us, how do you feel these varieties taste? How, do they, uh, you know, is the quality going to meet your specifications? And so it's been a really exciting process of jointly coordinating research and engaging in research um, that both uh, offers an opportunity for the industry to provide input on variety selection, but also um, for producing countries to hear that kind of quality information from the industry to have a better understanding of what the, what the market is interested in. And so I think it's this, growing process of improving those bridges, not just between single organizations, but the industry at scale and producing um, countries and, and marketing authorities who are really interested in understanding where the market's going. So this trial program has been a really important bridge in bringing those communities together. As you're probably also very aware, we have um, historically had some medium term technology from breeding programs, the, the F1 hybrids, that um, is a technology that is now transitioned from you know, 46 crosses where we evaluated the performance <clears throat> and identified four that were really worthy of advancing to the next stage of pre-commercial trials. We are in the process of propagating those materials and then they will be um, transmitted to uh, growers in Guatemala and Peru to do pre-commercial trials to really see whether those varieties, um, those hybrids outperform the local check. You know, you it, it, maybe they will, maybe they won't. You don't know. With research, you just never know. And so the point is, is that we have to put them into a into a commercial type scale to see whether the variety performs well, whether the hybrids perform well. And so um, by all accounts, it's going to be an interesting technology. And, and again, in the end, when it comes to varieties, it's about giving farmers choices. And so while any one of those hybrids or any one of the varieties in the multi-location variety trial may be really exciting for one grower, but not that exciting for another. And the point is, is to create choice that farmers have choice and that the industry has a choice. And so really this is what this trials program about is based on what we've got now in the pipeline, what is available and what works and how can we um, expand those, those choices and opportunities for growers as well as the industry. And finally, um, we launched Innovea, our global coffee breeding network. This is a tremendously exciting co-opetition model that was launched in 2022 in partnership with nine countries. Um, the principles around this really are about taking, uh, recognizing that fundamentally uh, coffee, coffee countries are, coffee producing countries um, are, you know, desire to export coffee. And I, I can see just from the, um, the, the chat that there's quite a number of, of people on the call today who are from producing countries. And so everyone's very aware of the need to, um, to position for competitive advantage. But we also know with the challenges of climate change, we needed a program that solved for both, that enabled countries and facilitated countries to continue their competitive position in exports, but at the same time, takes advantage of the cooperative and collaborative science because the challenges of climate are huge and the ability of any one company, any one country to solve this on their own is really, is really limited. And so by working together, we've developed this co-opetition model that we hope really drives value for producing countries, but also creates opportunity to really solve the big production challenges that we're all gonna be facing in the, in the years ahead. So I'd like to actually invite um, my colleague, Tanya, Dr. Tanya Humphrey to join me now. And um, I'd like her to talk a bit more about the breeding program. So maybe you could give a quick introduction to the program and then I'll ask you a few questions. The biggest thing about Innovea that really makes me excited and why this is so different from what has come before is the fact that it's a global collaborative network. So typically, traditionally, coffee breeding is done by national coffee institutes within the confines of a single country which means breeders are working with a narrow range of genetic diversity. They can only work really with what they have available and they can only work with the limited environments that they have available within a particular country. And so now what we have is five different, I mean, nine different country partners all joining together with WCR, working together to improve the genetic material for, for breeding. So this means nine countries together 
share the data. They collect the data across all of these different environments. So we have many different environmental conditions that we're testing the same um, population of diverse material. Everyone's collecting data in the same way and all of this gets pulled together and analyzed and, and uh, analyzed together, which enables us to really optimize the selections across all of this material and, and share the results of that. So all of that improved genetics gets then spread out again to all of the nine partners. So it's really a fundamental fundamentally different way of doing things because of this collaborative um, global network uh, approach. So multiple environments, we're using um, modern genomics approaches. So very much the latest techniques in bioinformatics and genomics and computer modeling and all of those cool tools that our, our scientists like to use. We've incorporated that into the design of the breeding program as well. All the partners will be bringing them up to sort of improve their learning and capacity to adopt some of these techniques. Um, and where we have it feeding into the network is this expanded genetic diversity. So instead of working individually within each country with the diversity that they have, we've negotiated access to all of this different material from countries all around the world. And all of that diversity has been fed into the front end of the network. So it's a really what we're building here. It's the global collaborative network, but it's also a big large scale, long term pipeline focused on the improvement of uh, genetic material for coffees, coffee. So that's a quick, a quick overview. Thanks. And, and you mentioned that it, you know, it's a, a long term. So what are the timelines of this? And, and what are the goals? What are we, what are we really breeding for? What's the, what are yeah, the so so, I mean, the, the short answer, the goals are the top three traits, which frankly are the things that matter most to the most numbers of people in, in, in the coffee ecosystem. And that's yield. First and foremost, you've got to look after the farmers. They have to maximize their yield in terms of getting the maximum outputs for minimal inputs. And that that helps kind of everyone in every, in every way. So a farmer, it increases farmer profitability. It allows them to maximize the use of resources to get the most out of a small plot of land. It minimizes the need to constantly be uh, needing to clear new land. And so yield is really, it's the first target of, frankly, any breeding program. That's the first one. Uh, disease resistant is next. So, you know, Vern showed you that nice slide of the coffee leaf rust resistant varieties. We know that's what we need. That's a fundamental need in, in everywhere around the world because coffee leaf rust is everywhere. So we need to address that. We need to make sure we have uh, coffee leaf rust resistance. And then coffee berry disease as well is, is the next thing that we're, we're looking at within the network. So disease resistance is always critically important to the farmer, you know, to minimize the, the risk of losses to their crop, but also to help reduce, you know, the application and need for pesticides and chemical control measures. So having a kind of a naturally resistant variety is really your best tool to combat pests and disease. So yield, disease resistance, and then the third thing that, of course, everyone wants is quality. We know that uh, in Arabica, quality is, is paramount, and, and whatever we're breeding has to keep that in mind. We know that the target markets for any of this material is looking for quality, so we need to be breeding and incorporating quality into the design from the first place. So that's those are the, the target traits. I think the critical part about the, the network is that, you know, Vern mentioned this idea of co-opetition. So the, it's, a, it's a concept that brings together both collaboration and competition. And so we know that coffee producing countries are very competitive with each other. And if, if they're thinking about breeding varieties, they're going to want to breed a variety that really suits the needs of their own farmers, you know, the particular environmental conditions that they have, perhaps uh, different pests and diseases, soil conditions, maybe target markets and, and quality or flavor profiles. All of those things can be very country specific. And so within the Innovaya network, what we, we have is a model that allows this global collaboration to happen because we're focused on the upstream pre-competitive work of population improvement. So what that means is we're creating an improved population of diverse material that is shared then with all of the partners 
And then all of the, each individual country partner can then take that material and do the finished variety development themselves. So this is where the competitive piece comes in. So that they take this, this great improved base material and they can develop the finished varieties that really meet their target needs and frankly can outcompete their neighbors if, if they so choose. So the design of this network includes both of those concepts, which, which is why we talk about a co-opetition model. And I think it's kind of fundamental to engaging all of these national partners because, you know, they, they both see the value of both, right? A collaboration, a scientists always want to collaborate. They see the benefit of sharing knowledge, techniques, data, all of that, th those sorts of things. But ultimately, the countries themselves want competitive varieties. So this allows them to do that. And I think, Vern, the, the other thing you talked about was the timeline. So I always cringe a little bit <laughs> when I have to answer this question because, you know, uh, breeding timelines are really long, uh, particularly when you're talking about a perennial, woody perennial crop like coffee. Uh, it doesn't happen fast. So, so the timelines are pretty long. Uh, but we could have, you know, if depending on the path that we choose to 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 identify and propagate a new variety, we could have a new variety out of this network in as in in around ten years would be kind of the earliest. But really, this is a long term endeavor. We are building this pipeline for the future. We are looking 20, 30 years out. So while we might get the the, the initial variety um, in 10 years, really the best stuff is going to come more like 20 years down the track. So this is a long term play. We need to be thinking about the long term benefits here and designing this pipeline that is really going to be full and continue to deliver for decades to come. So long after we're all retired and <laughs> gone I think this this breeding program is going to continue but that's how you have to think that's how it's been done in every other agricultural crop they had a head start they started uh, decades ago we're just really getting started now in coffee so we're a little bit behind but we have to be thinking in the same way we have to get this pipeline full so that in 10 20 years we've got a constant supply of new and improved varieties because it's an ongoing activity there's an constant need for new and improved varieties uh, to compete, to deal with climate change, to deal with new pests and diseases, all of those kinds of things. So long term, for sure. And when you think about this program, it's really focused on Arabica. I'm curious if you could give us a little more information about our work stepping into a Robusta and what that looks like in the months and years ahead. Yeah, sure. So you saw the Robusta catalog, really, that's kind of a, um, a big first foray into Robusta, um, but we're getting into Robusta in a more serious way. And the next thing will be a breeding program. So right now, in this current year, we're kind of in, in a planning stage. So we're scoping out what is the opportunity in Robusta? What is the need for breeding in Robusta? What material is out there? What are the the, what's the demand signal coming from both the market but also from the producers? What do the producers need in terms of target traits, quality improvements, disease resistances, all of those things? So right now we're scoping it out. So, you know, I, we don't exactly know what it's going to look like, but I think really what we're targeting is essentially a similar kind of idea to Innovea and the Arabica Breeding Network. We're thinking it'll be some type of global collaborative effort in robusta breeding where we partner with different uh, some uh, national institutes and uh, different producing countries who are interested in robusta so right now we're scoping it out we're starting the comp the partnership uh, discussions and hopefully within a year or so we will be uh, announcing announcing that that as a more tangible concrete plan uh, you know I say it's it's going to look similar to Arabica in Innovea, but the, the reality is Robusta is a different species <laughs> for a start. It's a different, the crop biology is different, the genetics are different, and so the technical design of how we do breeding is going to be different, uh, and as well the partners are different. Not all the same countries produce Arabica and Robusta, and certainly um they are of differing importance to some of our existing partners. And there's some new partners that we may want to be bringing into the network because uh, Robusta has a, a different global um, distribution of who's interested, which countries are involved. And so there'll be different partners. There'll be a different breeding strategy. 
but the global collaborative concept is is certainly something that we will hold true to. Excellent. So I'd like to actually jump from the breeding all the way to the end of the of the um, the pipeline, which is varieties. We get asked all the time about how you know how does WCR deliver varieties to farmers? And I think you know in my earlier remarks I talked a bit about our nursery program, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how breeding programs for coffee typically deliver new plants to farmers and and how WCR is involved and, and what our role is. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the short answer is it's different in every country. So there's kind of no one size uh, fits all. And so when we think about how varieties move out to farmers, our, our thinking tends to, to, to focus on one, one country at a time. But in, in general, you know, part of our approach is working with the National Coffee Institutes because they already have systems in place in general uh, for putting varieties out to their farmers, working with local propagators, running trials, all of those kind of downstream steps that you need for uh, variety introduction. So we typically will work with the National Coffee Institute and the partners that they work with to facilitate that process. But, you know, one of the things we recognise is we're in the variety business, WCR, and everything we do is about improving varieties and moving them out to market. And one of the things we've really learned is that the that part of the process isn't always very functional in, in countries. You know, Vern talks about genetic testing and purity of uh, seedlings that a farmer may buy. We know that this is a problem in many of our countries. And so if we are putting varieties out there and they're being propagated by uh, independent propagators, nursery operators, and selling these seedlings to farmers, we need to ensure that that system is working well, that there's a strong supply of actual verified genetically pure material moving out to farmers. And so that's where, you know, it touches on our nursery and seed sector work where we work within countries to try and improve, uh, make improvements in that system. And as well, we have a whole trials program, which, you know, when you breed a variety, you, you identify one tree, basically, that that's the one you're looking for that has all the target traits and looks really good. And you've got to get that one tree multiplied up tested, verified, making sure that you're really confident that this is the one that's going to help out the farmers or the industry or, or, or whoever's going to be using it. So there's a whole scale up process that needs to happen between breeding and farmer introductions. And part of that is trials. So scaling up to, to run trials in multiple locations, uh, do on-farm trials to allow farmers to access, to get experience with the new variety, uh, as well as all of the propagation systems that allow that to be properly propagated and moved out to farmers. So we work in all that space. We have a breeding program, we run trials, as well as nursery and seed sector cleanup. So all of these things are really integrated uh, and they're all connected to help, help with the goal of moving varieties uh, out to farmers. And like I said, it's really, it's customized uh, per, per each country because really it's not done in the same way in any two places. So I think that's good, Vern. Uh, can I ask you a question? I, I think it's uh, my, my turn because, you know, uh, one of the things I'm always thinking about, I'm, I'm always thinking about the breeding program and the network and the agreements and the partnerships and the data and all of this kind of more operational stuff, you know, uh, because that's, that's frankly my job. But maybe if we step, step up a little, you know, as, as CEO, Vern, uh, I'm, I'm thinking what are your priorities you know, if you if you take it up a notch and think big picture, what what are you what's uh, important for you in the coming year? Thanks, Tanya. And I have to say, I really do appreciate your intensive engagement in the operational details of our of our programs. Um, and and I think that it's because we have really shored up our operational effectiveness in the as particularly since your arrival about a year ago. We are now in a position where we are really looking to the horizon to see what our industry's needs are. Um, it's no secret that there are many challenges in the regulatory space as um, importing countries are increasingly uh, concerned about pesticide residues on coffee, on the provenance of coffee, traceability. There are many, many issues facing coffee um, on the regulatory side. And when I think about the role that science and technology needs to play to provide a support and a, and, um, a solution to some of those challenges, I think that as we 
as we drill down into the details of what is the research agenda that really needs to be advanced, um, we really need to be listening to that demand signal. So there's a regulatory environment that varieties need to fit into. Um, it, it only reinforces the importance of focusing on pest and disease resistance. If we want a world in which we're using less pesticides, then that needs to be a priority in the breeding program, right? That that's how you address that challenge, or that's a really powerful way to address that challenge. And so when I think about our, our year and the years ahead, I see that we need to come together with our national partners. And there are many of you on the phone or on the, on the call today, and I'm really excited that you're here because we need to work together to define the key priorities that need to be the targets for investment to continue the flow of coffee from producing countries so that the opportunity and the revenue generated can continue and the opportunity that coffee presents. At the same time, I think our industry needs to consolidate around a set of shared priorities on what we seek to achieve. And I think, as James said at the outset, quality, quality, quality. We want coffee mm -hmm. to taste good. <laughs> so when I think about the kinds of research efforts and projects that we're going to be undertaking and the partnerships we'll build, it's to take that entire demand signal, the demands that our, our industry has on quality and identifying research opportunities that really help us do better in our breeding programs, but also to identify those research priorities that aren't going to be touched by WCR defining a shared agenda and mobilizing public investment towards those goals, which will be implemented by others. It's not implemented by WCR per se, but as an industry organization that represents predominantly the, you know, roasters predominantly, but some other, you know, allied industry and those who make a business of coffee, we want coffee to succeed. And so we want to make sure that the investment that's happening in coffee is commensurate with the challenges that we're facing as a commodity. And so that's the conversation that I seek to broker in the coming months and years is to define what do we need to be focusing investment on and bring that message from our collective community, from producing country scientists and the industry to the investors, the development donors, the science granting agencies in a number of countries and get them focused on those key challenges that we're facing as an industry. Because if we don't work together, um, we're not going to be able to solve these really large challenges in the years ahead. So I'm really excited to um, have you on board to this process, Tanya. Dr. Humphrey will be a very integral part of this, this effort. So I'd like to turn it over to Alexa, who I think may have some questions she'd like to um, bring forward. Absolutely. We've received a number of questions. Um, and if you have more to add, to add to the discussion, please enter them in the Q&A box over to the side, but um, we'll get started. And we can go a little bit over the hour. Um, for those of you that can hang in there, um, we'll try to answer as many as possible. Um, Tanya, I'm going to look to you first. We've received some great questions about Innovea, um, and some of them are around the partner country selection. Um, can you speak a little bit to how did we select the particular partners? And maybe, Maeve, can you uh, move us backwards to that to the slide that lists the Innovea network? Um, Tony, can you speak to who's involved and what are the opportunities for other countries to participate in future and what might the criteria be? Yeah, okay. That's good. Thanks, uh, Alexa. And whoever asked that question, we, we do get this a lot because uh, the first thing people notice is kind of who's missing <laughs> in this network. You know, that we know there's a whole lot more coffee producing countries. Uh, so there's layer there's layers to this. Um, and certainly, you know, WCR as an organization, we have focused countries. So, you know, remember Vern showed that the graph of, of the top coffee producing countries where production is really, really outpacing everyone else. So those top countries, Brazil, Colombia and Vietnam, uh, a lot of that increase in productivity can be ascribed to innovation, which means these countries have really strong innovation systems. They have breeding programs. They have a whole lot in place already. And essentially, as an organization, we, we see they don't really need our help. <laughs> and our focus is on the rest of the countries, the ones trying to keep preserve the origin diversity and allow, and support those other countries to be able to stay in the game, to be able to compete and improve and make productivity gains, uh, just like those uh, leading coffee countries have done. And so for that reason, those countries are, are absent from our network. Um, but then the other, the other thing is, you know, we, 
I get to come in. I came in a year ago and I get to come in and announce Innovaya as this cool new thing. But I am very much aware that this took years, absolutely years in building. So these relationships and partnerships we have with National Coffee Institutes were years in development. And, and partly it stems from uh, another one of our programs that you may have heard us talk about, the IMLBT, which was a variety trial, a global variety trial where we, we put 30 varieties out in 29 different sites in 18 different countries. And through that massive international uh, variety trial, that allowed us to start working and collaborating with some of these country partners. And those collaborative relationships really formed the basis of, of, of our Innovaya partnerships. So people that we worked with under IMLBT and established work, good collaborative relationships over many years, have now evolved into uh, partnerships under Innovaya. One of the other criteria though, you know, is that the countries have to have some capacity in breeding. So a whole lot of our country partners um, don't have any breeding capacity at all. They don't have plant breeders. They don't have mechanisms in place to necessarily even to do variety trials in some cases. So the, a base level of capacity in breeding was a requirement to join the network. Um, and then, you know, so we basically, we worked with people we already were building collaborations with who had interest and capacity in breeding, but this is not a one-time deal. It's not a in, you're out. Um, this is just the first round. So if you know anything about breeding, it's kind of a cyclical process. There's multiple rounds of crosses, trialing, evaluation and selections. And so right now we're just at the start. We've signed on with uh, these nine country partners but the reality is when we get to the next cycle, we'll be bringing in new diversity and there'll be a whole new opportunity to bring in new partners. So we hope all of these existing partners will choose to continue. They'll see the value of it, but there'll be a, an opportunity to bring in new partners. And so as we get closer to that, that point in time, perhaps around four or five years from now, we will be opening it up to potential new collaborators to come in at that point. And certainly, you know, we see the benefit of collaboration for sure and more environments, more sites, more country partners is certainly something that we will be entertaining in future. Excellent. So on a related note, Tanya, for those, we have a number of people on the call who are farmers or cooperatives at origin. Um, and Bill Bayer is asking, how can someone make contact with the partner, so the National Coffee Institute in their country, and learn more about eventually participating? Um, do you have any guidance at this point in time? Yeah, I mean, I could just suggest that they reach out to the National Coffee Institute in their country. Um, you know, they should be fairly easy to find there government-funded entities. They've been working in coffee for a long time and a lot of their scientists and technical staff are already plugged in to the farmer community. So it would just be a matter of reaching out to them. And, you know, I, I talked about the, the co-opetition idea in that the National Coffee Institutes are the ones who are going to be developing those final finished varieties. And so they do need to connect to farmers and extension staff and all kinds of uh, propagators and other people operating in this space to enable those varieties to be introduced in, in the individual countries. So, you know, there absolutely will be a role for individual farmers and, and that is handled by the National Coffee Institute. So, you know, I, I would suggest look into it, find out who they are. If you, if you want to, you can approach us and we can perhaps uh, provide a, a single point of contact to get the ball started. But I think there will be opportunity for sure as material moves through the system. Excellent, thank you. Um, one key element you noted, Vern has noted, James noted, quality. Um, can you speak to how um, we are helping serve as a bridge, not only for industry, so roasters and suppliers, to provide feedback on new and improved varieties, but also within country, how we're supporting you know, national partners in developing that cupping quality and expertise and being able to provide local feedback on quality. Yeah, so I think there's multiple, you know, quality is a, a tricky thing. And especially, you know, I think about Innovaya in three years time, we're going to have 5,000 trees in, all around the world that we have to assess for quality. 
So this is no small feat to try and do this. And and basically we do it through, we're following multiple channels to sort of get the information we need to assess quality. So one of the ways, the first ways we did this is, you know, I mentioned our international multi-location variety trial. A lot of that material has been assessed for quality through multiple years of cupping. Uh, those samples have been uh, cupped locally within countries. So the, the local sites, for example, in Kenya or, or Peru, those, those coffee samples were cupped locally so that the researchers and the local partners and farmers and whoever was involved in that uh, can get a sense of which material performs well. As well, we did global cupping. So we collected samples from all over the world and we sent them to uh, member companies to do cupping and all of them were kind of processed and roasted in a consistent way and they were uh, cupped and, and assessed for quality. So all of that information up front has been used to design the breeding crosses that we've used. So quality has was a target right up the front end. So the highest quality scoring material was used to design the crosses. So we're cro crossing high quality with high quality, which is the best way to start. And as we move through the process, we will be assessing quality through multiple ways. So there'll be local cupping will continue uh, with the local partners. Uh, we are we will be doing some form of global cupping as well, similar to what we've done with uh, the IMLBT. And as well, we're pursuing a, a kind of a third avenue, which falls into the category of tool development. And this is where we um, we partner with outside expertise. So an example of this is a proposal that's in development. Actually, it's going to be submitted this week. So it's very fresh is all around this idea of measuring quality. So uh, our problem is 5,000 trees that need to be measured for quality. We know we can't give 5,000 uh, samples to cuppers to evaluate. Logistically, that's just impossible. So as breeders, as scientists, we're kind of looking for a shortcut. We're, we're looking to develop some kind of instrumental measure that can at least give us a first pass. You know, there's no real substitute for giving the coffee to a person. But if we can narrow it down, if we can get a broad approximation of quality through some kind of instrumental measure, that will help us enormously. And so we've partnered to do this. We've partnered with some, you know, food scientists and chemists and sensory specialists and, you know, people in academia uh, at Ohio State University and at the USDA who are really thinking about this in a really, you know, in-depth way to develop these tools that ultimately will allow us to do our job better. And so quality is a big target for them to, to, to develop some way in which we can analyze this material in a, in a larger scale. So quality absolutely is, is a target for us. It's, it's a big challenge. It's a complicated thing to evaluate, but we're, we're trying multiple parallel paths and different approaches to find, find a way that works. Thanks for that comprehensive answer. Um, Vern, I'm gonna to pivot to you and toss you a different question. Um, Clarice Coyne asked about Café La Birca. So as another species um, of coffee, I know you recently shared the stage with Erin Davies of Kew Gardens in the UK. Can you speak to how we view some of these other species uh, as part of our, our research work? So I, I think if we just reflect back on the number of $452 million. So as an industry facing climate change, and you've all seen the productivity levels that we have a lot, you know, it's flat. <laughs> we need to double down and invest in innovation. And one of the things we know about science and innovation is that you don't always know the answer at the outset, right? You need to try a lot of different things. So when you look at other commodities, if you look at um, apples or strawberries, there is some work in which you always want to have a you know, the exploration of new and innovations. And so when we think about Liberica or other species of coffee, there's 130 species of coffee that create, that provide a tremendous amount of opportunity. There is also the reality of domestication and commercial production. So there are some cases where species may have tremendous opportunity or, or feasibility for niche tailored production. And if you go to very high-end vegetable shops, 
in, in the UK or in California, you can find really unusual products sold at a very high price that create tremendous opportunity and value for the farmers who grow those. And so I think what we don't know is that climate change is enormous. And I think if you talk to Dr. Walter Bettigan, his speeches on you know climate modeling, we really actually don't know what the world's gonna look like in 20 years. We should probably put a lot of innovation on the table and test it. And I think that this is the this is the conversation that Aaron and I had a couple of weeks ago in, in London at the, the British Coffee Association meeting is, there's a need for tremendous creative thinking right now. And I would encourage all of you to engage in that exercise as, as, uh, as a member of the industry, what do you want to sell your customers? What are your customers asking for? New, innovative, different products? As growers, as researchers in producing countries, what are the opportunities that you see around you? I think the unifying challenge we have as an industry is that there is tremendous underinvestment. And when we have to make very hard decisions on resource allocation, as an organization, this is what, you know, this is our job is, is trying to figure out with a very limited resource of it, envelope, for coffee agriculture, we focus on the most highest likelihood of success options, which is pipeline breeding programs. That's what every other commodity already has. And it is the most um, strategic investment as a foundational investment. But that's not to say that we shouldn't be innovating in a lot of other spheres. We just realize there's resource constraints and these are trade-off decisions. So I think that when it comes to species, where a country has a specific species on offer in the country, like I think the case of, of the Excelsa mm -hmm. in Uganda, that is a unique opportunity for Uganda. Go for it. <laughs> That's what I'd say. And I think that for other countries, access to different species is going to be limited. And so I think you're constrained by what you have access to, levels of investment available. And every country and every co-op and every farmer is going to have to choose for themselves what's the best path in the years ahead. And so from our vantage point, I'd say all innovation is worth it in the climate change environment of the 21st century. When we talk about our own resource use and our choices and our, our decision making, we are going to provide the highest leverage strategic investments, looking at what all other, you know, woody perennial crops are doing. What are the normative investments that are made as foundational investments to secure the long term supply of coffee? That's my job. <laughs> so I'm gonna res I'm gonna mobilize resources for that agenda using the tools and technologies that have worked and are tried and true in other commodities. But, but innovation can provide tremendous upside and tremendous opportunity. And so I would encourage creativity in the 21st century. How else are we gonna get through this? So I hope that helps. Innovation and creativity, that's a really good note to end on. And reluctantly, we need to draw this to a close 10 minutes past the hour. Um, I hope for all of you uh, who are still with us that we have clearly conveyed the vital importance of research to ensuring the future of coffee. Every single coffee company has a stake in its future success and really should be part of the collective investment of world coffee research. So I want to thank all of you member companies for your deep commitment in making this work possible. And for those of you who aren't members, please reach out to us. Please pick up the phone, send us an email. We'd love to explore membership with you. Um, continue to follow our work, sign up for our newsletter, and keep tabs on us through social media. And I wish you all goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.